and welcome to my channel, bonsoir et bienvenue sur ma chaîne, my name is Muriel and guess what, it's time for another monthly reading wrap up. Now I'm actually filming on the 30th of March but since I usually take time to edit my videos I thought I would uh, be preemptive and call this a wee bit early. This month I read eight books once again, I don't know, I'm on fire, I don't know what's happening, I'm just enjoying it. And what's more, all the books were basically good, if not great slash amazing, so yeah, a great reading month overall. First I'll mention The Call of Cthulhu and Other Weird Stories by none other than H.P. Lovecraft. I started this in the last week of February and then finished it in the first week of March. I did a review for this particular editions and, you know, my overall impressions of what I've so far read of Lovecraft's work. I thoroughly enjoyed this. It's everything I wanted, basically. I got to sink my teeth into Lovecraft's work, get to know his universe a bit better. I mean, it's a good selection of stories. Some of them, of course, in the Cthulhu slash Elder Gods mythos, etc. And I'll probably at some point read one or both of the other anthologies curated by S.J. Toshi. During that same week, I also read Kraken by China Mieville, for which I also made a review. If you want to check that out, I love this. It was insane, weird in the best possible way. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. It wasn't perfect. I was a wee bit let down by the ending. But overall, the wild ride this book was was well worth it. I really, really like this. Then I read this, Women in Art by Rachel Ignatowski. Now recall that in February I read Women in Science by the same author and illustrator. So this is the same principle. It takes a look at, well, women in the arts. Simple as that. Each time you get that kind of spread. I mean, of course, the art style I think is absolutely gorgeous. So you get an artist a bit of her biography, important achievements, and bits of miscellany about her. And you've got women from, you know, ancient China through to the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and of course up to the present day, more or less. I mean, some of the women are still alive today, and from different nationalities, different ethnic backgrounds. So, I mean, a great selection. Overall, though, I didn't enjoy it quite as much as I did Women in Science because, well, for one thing, I thought the selection process didn't feel as uh, coherent as it did in Women in Science. I sometimes wondered how she selected the female artist, what criteria she was using. So I know this is a minor concern, but I'm kind of obsessed with these little details. Sometimes I thought, the way she used, like, so the graphic frames, it didn't always follow the same exact pattern, and it did in women's science, and I'm a detail-obsessed person, so that's the kind of thing that bothers me a bit, but I know this is very particular. And I was a bit disappointed not to see a couple of artists I was familiar with, like Artemisia Gentileschi, although, that being said, she does mention a couple of uh, Renaissance Italian artists whose backgrounds and stories actually are very similar. And perhaps Gentileschi has been sufficiently rehabilitated in the arts that, you know, she doesn't need the extra representation, maybe. Or someone like Camille Claudel, who was the pupil and lover of uh, Auguste Rodin, a famous French sculptor. And another thing, though, that I really didn't understand, one of the artists mentioned is mainly a musician who also did eclipse photography, so scientific photography, and I was like, none of the other artists have anything to do with either literature or, well, music. I thought the focus of this book was going to be, well, the plastic arts. I mean, all right, there are cinematographers included, but just one music composer. It felt very discordant, like a, like a false... <laughs> Yeah, like a false note, <laughs> pun intended, I guess. So I was like, ooh, I was a bit jarred there. That being said, I'd love to see a book about, like, well, maybe not musicians in the pop music sense, because then that would be a, a book thick like that, but maybe, you know, classical music. I know some names 
in like the 19th century. That would be cool. So uh, I didn't get that inclusion. I really didn't. So it's these teensy tiny little things that probably wouldn't bother most people, but taken together, that's why I rated this slightly lower than Women in Science. So Women in Science was like a 10 out of 10 for me. This was like a 9 out of 10, but still excellent. Beautiful artwork. I'm curious to see if she's going to do another book in this year. I know there's a Women in Sports, but no offense to those who are sports fans, but I don't give a single toss about sports. So I will not be reading that one. I'm just not interested enough. But yeah, I'll be keeping an eye on this author and the straight in the future. I also read two works of feminist, or at least female-centric classic science fiction, both of which are published in the Science Fiction Masterworks collection. First, I read Native Tongue by Suzette Hayden Elgin. I did a review for this book, if you're interested in that. I'll give a quick, short recap, though I realise I forgot to do that for Kraken, but you can just check out my review. So, in the future, the United States has revoked the right to vote for women, and perhaps this applies to the rest of the world. And humans have also expanded into space, come into contact with alien species. But to secure trade agreements with said alien species, they have to use the services of linguists. Linguists being a bit more than just, you know, academics interested in human languages. They're actually families who specialize intensely in all kinds of languages, and more importantly, who specialize in alien languages, the acquisition of them and well, that gives them basically a monopoly on securing these trade agreements for various governments. The story takes a closer look at the women of these linguist families and explores the themes of a female-only language and how that could help women achieve, well, liberation. I was happily surprised by this book. Like I said in my review, it's far from perfect. There's some serious issues with like elements of female separatism, something which could be found in some sections of the second wave feminist movement, and also the systematic negative, and I mean really, really negative characterization of all the male characters. That kind of bugged me a bit, but I still think it's worth a read, especially if you're interested in like all the works of uh, yeah, feminist or female-centric uh, science fiction. Following from that, I read Ammonite by Nicola Griffith. Once again, I have a review for this, if you'd like to check it out. Quick recap. So, an anthropologist, Marge, is sent to a planet called Jeep, where previously humans had colonized this planet, but a virus endemic to that planet wiped out all the males, a large part of the females, and so three to four hundred years later remain only female humans, women, so it's a planet with all women societies who have managed to survive and reproduce and have their own cultures. And so Marge is sent both as an like active trial for a vaccine to counteract the virus and to, well, understand these cultures and potentially reach agreements for a company she's sort of working for. It had a lot of potential. That was my impression. Like, lots of avenues of, you know, thought and reflection could have been actively explored, but weren't. So I ended up being fairly disappointed by this novel, especially because it had been, like, lauded by a few people I encountered on the internet. And I have read a lot of books with that general theme of, like, female dystopias, female utopias, and female societies, and I'd never come across this one. So I was like, oh, I missed this one. So I was expecting a lot from it, and it just didn't live up to my expectations, unfortunately. There are interesting tidbits, and perhaps, you know, sources of inspiration for perhaps future writers. I don't know. So that's cool. And yeah, so I was a bit bummed out by that. I still think it's worth reading. Like I said, if only to make you think about these things, to perhaps invite you to further those discussions in your own work or with other people, that's always valuable, that you have a book that makes you think. At least uh, that's my belief. But yeah, it could have been so much better. <laughs> and at the same time I read Ammonite, I also read this. Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are by Franz the Wall, a fairly well-known primatologist who specializes in chimps and bonobos. This is basically a book about animal behavior and more specifically animal cognition. So a book about ethology, which is a subject I'm very much interested in. I already have a few books that talk about that particular subject, some which focus more on animal emotions as well, their emotional lives. And I usually really enjoy those books, and I have books that focus on particular species. In my case, that would be birds, more specifically than that, 
cool kids and parents. I thought it was a good book. I mean, it's a good addition to my little collection on the topic, but it wasn't great either. I think I was expecting a bit more to look more in depth and to different species. Also there's very little material about the emotional lives of animals. This is more purely about like behavior and cognition. And he does actually admit that he didn't even touch upon the subject of animal emotion, so fair enough. Also, keeping in mind that Francois is a primatologist, he really does spend a lot of time talking about chimps and bonobos, which of course is very valuable in that field of research. But for some weird reason actually I'm not that interested in monkeys or apes, despite them being our closest living cousins. I don't know, I'm just, maybe it's because they're so much like humans and uh, I prefer to focus on really non-human animals, I don't know. Also, and it's also a minor complaint, if you can call it that. He does a great job of explaining that, you know, the difference between humans and non-humans is really one of degree and not of kind. An idea first enunciated by none other than Charles Darwin himself, and I obviously 100% agree with that, so he says, you know, there is nothing that's truly unique to humans, but then he does go into like a bit of an aside about language and says, I think that might be the truly unique human thing, language. But then he does admit that the components of language might be present in other non-human species and that non-human species have ways of communicating that approach language. So it's like, so it's not really unique, ultimately. I guess, you know, most humans need that thing that separates them distinctly from other animals. And perhaps even if he's a very enlightened scientist studying that particular subject, he needs that little niche of uh, human uniqueness. And in his case, it's language. I don't know, because then he kind of drops it afterwards. So it was a very weird, like, couple of pages. I'm like, where are you going with this, mate? Why are you, why are you so bothered by this? I don't know. Minor complaint. It's actually probably be a good introduction into the subject for people. Yeah, sure. So if you've never read anything about ethology or, you know, like pop science books about animal behavior, cognition and emotion, give this a try. I'm happy to have it in my library in any case, but I've read better is my point. And then last week, I read two more books. First, I read Le Consentement de Vanessa Springora. So so again, this is a book in French that I will be talking about in English. I'm not devoting enough time to French on my channel, I feel. I feel a bit, a bit guilty about that. Anyway, so I think I've mentioned this in my uh, small booktuber tag. I talked about my recent reads and my future reads for the coming weeks. But so uh, this is a memoir about a woman who had a relationship when she was 14 with a 50-year-old author this author is still alive. You can check this out in the news. I mean, this is an ongoing uh, case in France. I mean, might have been put aside a bit because of coronavirus. So Gabriel Matzneff is an author who was uh, popular or at least respected in the 70s and 80s. I'd never heard of him, but I, I'm not up to date on uh, contemporary French literature, to be honest. And well, the guy is a pedophile. I mean, he was open about the fact he only liked partners to be between the ages of 10 and 16. <laughs> sure. But she had a relationship with him when she was 14. And then he wrote about her because he wrote about all his partners and his diaries that he would then publish. And so she wanted to have something that would be a, a counterpoint to his narrative. Kind of the idea, it's the idea of the Me Too movement, really, that the victims have a voice and have their side of the story to tell. And so that's what she did. And it's called Le Consentement, Consent, because while well, she had a hard time actually coming to terms with the fact that she was a victim of manipulation and abuse, perhaps not outright rape in the traditional sense, because she says, I did consent, but I was 14. So you can't have informed consent. I like that notion. It's, it's not just about consent in and of itself. It's about informed consent and you cannot give informed consent when you're 14. And so she talks about how this relationship impacted her youth and her young adult years and her psyche. I mean, she went through some shitty stuff, especially since the guy put this into the public sphere. I mean, there's that extra dimension of making it public that's really, really trashy. I thought it was interesting. I don't think it was horrifying because, and I'll get back to this, when I do a review for a future book I'll be reading very soon, let's just say I have had a similar experience 
So a lot of people I saw like on Goodreads say, oh, it was very uncomfortable to read. I didn't feel that. Like it didn't touch me in that way. It's definitely heartbreaking to see how much this destroyed her, at least for a long while, for a long period of her life. I mean, now she's a successful editor for a, a big publishing house in France. So I mean, good for her. But yeah, she really felt it was important to put her story out there. It's hard to be too criticizing about this book because it is a memoir and I'm like, it's her story, she gets to say what she wants. I, I don't feel like it's my place to question that, but I guess I would have liked a bit more depth in the analysis of the relationship and the guy's psychology, which I guess you can't really do because it's, it's not a character, but I thought it was a bit surface level, which I realized sounds really shitty because it's a person's memoir and lived experience, right? So I'm, I'm really not trying to come down on this woman by any means. What is interesting is to see the social atmosphere that surrounded her at the time. There was a very permissive ambiance in France in the 70s and 80s, you know, after May 68, Miss 68, if you know what that is. That wasn't like pro pedophile in the sense that everyone was like, cool, let's uh, have sex with kids or at least very young teenagers. But yeah, there was a wee bit of that going on in a certain part of the intellectual literary sphere. It's very fucked up, to be honest. I read quite a bit about it since learning about this book. It opened my eyes, and I mean, I'm not even shocked by much, but even I was like, damn. So yeah, in that respect, it's really interesting to read about that, to see how the adults around her failed her completely, how alone she was. Now, interestingly enough, she said that she was not interested in going to the police, because, well, for one thing, I mean, statute of limitations, it's way too late for her. But the justice system in France has decided to open uh, an investigation against him for incitation to pedophilia through his writing, and perhaps also uh, soliciting uh, underage prostitutes in uh, the Philippines, young boys. And I don't know, maybe recent victims can still come forward. So I'm curious to see what's going to happen with that. And I mean, it falls within this whole conversation about the Me Too movement and the privilege of certain artists or men of power, Weinstein, Polanski, things like that. So it, it was an interesting read. It did touch me in certain ways, because I think this woman's been through a lot of suffering and I can definitely relate to that. And at the same time, I was looking for something that I didn't quite find, with which I could not quite relate, which is what I wanted. So I gave this three stars on Goodreads. Uh, I do think it's important we have these kinds of uh, first-person accounts of... The blurry concept of consent versus informed consent and age of consent, etc. And then I finished that in three days, so it reads really quickly, so that's always nice. But I also read Embassy Town by China Mieville. This was awesome! I mean, I loved Kraken, but this tops that easily. Oh, yeah, no, it, it does top it. It's brilliant. It's simply brilliant, that's all I can say about it for now. Don't worry, I will be making a review about this, of course and hopefully it'll be out this week. It was brilliant. The dude is an insane genius. <laughs> Isn't that a bit redundant to say? A lot of geniuses are a bit insane, and I like that. No, I mean, I think, yeah, I'm going to become a China Miegel fan if it keeps up like that. I mean, I'm going to try something else by him. I don't know what. If you have any suggestions, I'm all ears. So uh, quickly, if you don't know what this is about, how can I even synopsize this? Um, so you have a woman living on a planet called Ariaka, and on this planet live native aliens called Hosts or Ariaki. And Ariaki cannot lie. They have a very strange language that does not allow their brains to process deception or things like metaphors and symbolism. They can only understand literal things for reasons I'll develop in my review. And then this place called Embassy Town is like the human settlement within a city of the, these Ariaki. And just crap goes down. I mean, <laughs> stuff goes down. They're like, a, you know, a colony, basically. And they have specialized humans to talk to the Ariaki because it's a whole process to communicate with them. And <laughs> it's amazing. This book is amazing. I was like, what? Like, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Like, this is on the level, easily on the level of uh, the Southern Reach trilogy. So 
between Vandermeer and Yeovil, I'm discovering this whole world of literature and weird fiction and mixings of science fiction, fantasy, horror, and stuff like that, and just making my brain work overtime. It already works overtime because I think all the time, but I mean, with stuff like that, it's awesome. I love it. I love this book. It's truly, truly great. This is a great novel. So stay tuned for my review, which I will do my best to make sure it comes up very soon. And that concludes my wrap up. Like I said, eight books once again. I don't know what's gotten into me, but uh, I'm loving that pace. And <laughs> what's more, a great selection of books. I mean, okay, so Native Tang and Ammonite were like more on the uh, seven out of 10 rating, but the rest was like eight, nine, even close to 10. So no, it's a great reading month. I hope I get a lot more of them this year. And uh, well, this month, I will be reading a couple of books that also have me very excited. I will be reading Stories of Your Life and Others by Ted Chang. I will be reading something called My Dark Vanessa, which I'm also excited about for very, very different reasons. I'm not even sure excited about is the right word, but I, I need to read that novel. And I also plan on doing a massive reread of all my Chronicles of Pern books. I've got eight of them and I will be spreading them out over the month of April and probably the first half of the month of May because I don't want to suffer a burnout over them since it's all in the same universe with a lot of the same ideas. And I'll be reading stuff alongside that, probably non-fiction or some of my graphic novels which I have waiting on my TBR shelf. I hope you're all doing well staying safe inside if you can. I hope you'll have a lovely day or evening as usual, and I shall see you in the next video. Bye-bye!